Hey church, it is time to worship the resurrection, to worship God, to worship Christ, to be involved in the Holy Spirit. This is the moment. We're here live at Jenkins Church. Uh, James is going to play a few moments uh, just to kind of prepare ourselves for worship. There'll be others that are going to be jumping on as, as, we, uh, as the time gets here. So take a moment in your place. Just relax for a moment. Find your um, way that you can identify with God right now in prayer, uh, in meditation, whatever it is. Listen to the music and as we wait for others to show up on our live event. God bless you all and prepare your hearts and minds for worship. These are are strange, strange days, but it's Sunday morning. It's Resurrection Day, so in your jammies or in your kitchen or on your computer or on your phone, I ask that you worship today because the sun does rise in the morning. Spring always is after winter. Healing always comes to the land, and resurrection in everything is real. So I praise God today that viruses don't win either. We are here to worship today, and I can't wait to worship with you. A couple of quick bits. The first one is, uh, the internet uh, all over the place right now, because of so many streaming events, seems it's it's a little sketchy sometimes. So we believe it's going to stay up. If it doesn't, we're continuing to record, and you can catch this later on our Facebook page, and then we're also going to post it on YouTube as well, or on our our website, rather, at JenkinsCP.org, and then on on YouTube. So just know that that if something does happen, we have a backup plan and you'll be able to worship here shortly. The second thing is, is that if you are uh, wanting to put in some prayer requests for our prayer time, go ahead and and put them in the comments right now. Somebody's going to write them down and bring them up to me so that we can have prayer over those names or over those situations here in a few moments. So I look forward to to getting those in, in in a minute and we will make sure that they're part of the prayer request. So that's what's going on today. We're going to Worship. We're going to do it in a very different way. It is so odd and so different, but that doesn't change that God's worthy of worship. If you believe that in your own house, wherever you are, say amen. Amen. So first we'll have a call to worship. I read this morning from Lamentations 3, and it's 19 through 24. The book of Lamentations is five chapters of some pretty desperate stuff. It's not pretty. But right in the middle, right in the middle of it, in chapter 3, there are some, some words of hope. 
And I think that's what we need to hear right now is a lot of words of hope. So I read from Lamentations 3, 19 through 24 for our call to worship. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do pray for hope this morning. We ask that you provide that to all of us in days that are so weird and so odd. We just ask for hope. Lord, just this morning, the mayor of Nashville has, a, has put in place a shelter at home call. And so we're all supposed to now kind of stay home, stay away from one another. And that's just so odd and so weird for us. And it's not what we want. And so we just ask God that in the midst of that, that you provide us hope. In the midst of illness, in the midst of sadness and grief, we ask for hope. In the middle of all of this, Lord, we ask for hope. And we ask it from you because you're the God that we believe can provide it to us. So we ask, Lord, that you allow us to feel the hope that you've already provided. We ask that you allow us to open our hearts and our minds to what hope looks like, how we can share it with one another so that we can all experience it and find our way out of this, this situation through the hope that you provide. We ask blessings on all of us who are now in this worship service because we believe that you can do this. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to be able to worship even in this odd way. We ask these things, Lord, because we know we desperately need you. And God's people said, Amen. I've asked James and Philip if they would help me in the worship service, and they jumped at the chance, and I thank them for doing that. They're going to have our first song for us this morning. Please sing along at home if you know any of the words. God bless. Should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend? Oh, you 
watches me is on the Sparrow Church. He's watching us. I have no doubt about that in these difficult days. We are protected. I asked a few moments ago if there would be an opportunity where we could pray some for, for some people in the church, and I saw a lot of people chime in. It looks like there may be 50 or more people watching right now. Uh, so we had a lot of prayer request, we, requests come in. We'll pray for those, but first I want to read James 5, the first half of verse 13. And the scripture is this, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. And so we go to God now in prayer. If you chimed in a couple last couple of minutes, we may not have gotten the prayer request, but know that I'll be praying for those uh, over the next few days uh, regardless. So, uh, but these are the names that, that have been brought to our attention so far. Maybe a couple of more that just came in. Uh, Lindsay Sargent, uh, Opal McClanahan, 
uh, the Haybeger family. We're praying for them. Mike and Anna are coming back from Ohio with the children, and we're going to, uh, to be able to welcome them back very soon. I think they're leaving Thursday to come back to Tennessee, so we'll be welcoming back, them back into the church, and we can't wait. Uh, Simone Marsalis, Melanie Soison, uh, Bill Rowland we're praying for, Alex Mindy, David Morton, and Andrew Brenneman. We pray for all these uh, now. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we, we thank you that we can turn to you in these difficult times. We, we thank you that, that when we pray, we believe that you're the recipient of that prayer, that you hear us, and that something in this moment of prayer changes things. We don't know how that works. We don't know if you reach down and touch some of these situations yourself. We don't know if you call on us to take care of things. We don't know. We just know that we're called to pray to you. And so, Lord, we do that right now. We we pray to you with these names that we've come to you now with, but also all of those names that we don't dare mention out loud, the ones that are heavy on our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you bless those in these times, that you do something in these, in these prayer requests, that something happens in this world that shows your glory and your brilliance in every way. We, we beg of these things right now of you, Lord, and we say thank you because you're a God that does act. So, so Lord, in this time, we know that your eye is on us. We know as we bring these things to you that goodness can come. We know these things, and that's why we pray the prayer that your, your, your son taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What you just learned in that prayer is there's no right way to do it because the preacher is nervous and he forgets words. But that doesn't change the fact that God hears those prayers and I thank God for it. So please continue praying in this time for all those on our list. Thank you. Before we get into our time of offering today, I want to, our time of, of sermon today, I want to I want to talk about the offering for just a second. One of the things about this church that I love is that it happens that this church lives out the gospel. We do things like people are helped. We do things like food is given to people. We do things like bills are paid for folks. Money is given to families in difficult times. Backpacks are given to people who need it. We check on other folks who are in difficult moments. This year, lunch tabs were given to, our lunch tabs were paid for, for students in schools who couldn't pay their own. These are are wonderful things that this church has done. We have given tents to the homeless. We've given goods to Nashville. All of these things has, have occurred, and it's been absolutely wonderful for the church to do that and to watch it done. We study Bible in this church. We study it seriously. We get down to the nitty-gritty and, and pull the verses and the words apart to make sure that we understand what the Scripture provides to us. We provide a building for 160 kids Monday through Thursday to learn about God and learn about education. In this building, that happens Monday through Thursday. So we do a lot of things out of this church. The reason I say that is... The church isn't stopping because of this virus. We are continuing to do that which we need to do. And so we need to keep our ties up. We need to continue giving as we can. Now, we understand some folks are in difficult times, and they need to receive rather than give right now. And we understand that. But for those of us who can give, I want us to encourage ourselves to continue doing that in very real ways. I want you to know that today I'm depositing my tithe. I'm actually giving a tithe and a half. I know that there are some that can't give right now, and we're giving a tithe and a half this week, my family and I. And I just ask those who are able to continue your tithes in whatever way you find right. You can mail those ties to P.O. Box 518 in Nolansville, Tennessee, 37135. Uh, you can uh, uh, very soon, we'll have PayPal set up on our website, and you can do that process so that you can pay that way your ties. Uh, or uh, you can even contact me if you have a, another idea that you'd like to propose. But we need to continue that as best we can because we're called to give to the church and to give to God. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue doing all the good work out of this place uh, and, and continue tithing as we are able. So if you would, know that as well. I want to have our sermon, our, our message next. And I want to start it off by saying this. We have had such an incredible range of motion, emotions this week. My emotions have been all over the place. 
one minute they're one way, the next minute they're another way. I've had a lot, a lot of anxiety. Maybe you've had anxiety. If you have, type amen in your messages. Honesty is good, and I want to tell you that I've been anxious. Not anxiety attack anxious, just this general sense of anxiety because I can't figure out what in the world is going on. Any time that we lose control, we get anxious. It's worrisome. What if, what if so-and-so happens, we ask ourselves, and, and we can't control whether we can, or we don't know whether we control what will happen or not, and because of that, anxiousness rises up. I get anxious every time I see those pictures of the hospital. I get anxious every time I see how Vanderbilt has set up new beds in a garage. Now, it's a very nice garage. It's done very well, but there are beds in a garage. I'm anxious. We men are not supposed to answer or to to admit that. Women probably aren't either, but I'm not a woman, so I can't speak to that. I just know that in in locker rooms and in boardrooms and in living rooms, I'm not supposed to admit that I'm anxious. Cool Hand Luke wasn't anxious. Batman wasn't anxious. Iron Man wasn't anxious. The quarterback in the Super Bowl isn't anxious, anxious, and, and we're not supposed to be anxious either. I am, though. I'm just telling the truth. Maybe you are, too. I've had other emotions. I've been very mad at times. Now, part of my mad is legit. Like, some people need to be making better sense than they're making right now. Take this seriously, you all. Please, take this COVID seriously. If we all just stayed at home, it would be so much better. And so, and so I get a little testy about that, maybe. I'm all about some righteous anger. My church folks know that. But I've been a little bit mad because of some selfish reasons, too. I had some plans, man, and those plans have now caught the COVID virus. I have a a dear friend who was supposed to be visiting me from visiting the States this summer. He's from France, and he was going to bring his family, and and who knows if that'll happen now. And I had all kinds of way to mess with them, too. They made me eat snails when I visited them in France, and so I was going to feed them chitlins, but I just wasn't going to tell them. Soccer just took off. Major League Soccer right here in Nashville, Tennessee. I took my boys to the inaugural game, and y'all, we had an absolute blast. We were in the supporter section, and we were chanting, and we were jumping up and down, and we were singing, and all that dumb stuff. It was one of those days that I remember where I was with my boys, you know, and we had already planned, made plans to go to a bunch of other games, too. I was having fun with my kids, you know, but that's on hold. Time is fleeting. Who knows how many chances we'll have to have that kind of fun again. And I've gotten mad about that. I'll admit it. I've been mad that in the middle of a disaster, I can't go see my family, mom and my grandmother. You realize how maybe time is short and you need to visit so much more than you have. And and suddenly I can't. I don't think now visiting anybody's a good idea. I don't have the COVID-19, but if we all just existed on our, on our thoughts about that, this virus would devastate us. So we stay at home, and I'm ticked because I can't go see my mom. I'm not trying to sound like a brat. I'm not. But this morning we're talking about emotions, and that emotion I have is very real. I've been angry. I've been angry that older folks are, are spending some of their last time in lockdown. I'm angry that kids won't have proms and, and graduations. I'm angry that the poor are going to take it on the chin again because the poor always take it on the chin. There is no margin for error. My friends on the streets that I tell you about, they have less than they did before. We're angry. I think that's why we all jumped on the folks about the toilet paper and those two guys in Chattanooga that bought all the hand sanitizers. They're an easy target when we're all just a little bit angry about the whole thing anyway. On the other side of that, though, I've been happy at times, too. I've laughed a bunch during this crisis. I mean, at this point, this is all just so real that we throw our hands up in the air and just enjoy the ride, right? This virus isn't letting us off anytime soon, and and so we might as as well find something good to laugh at. So I've laughed at at internet memes, and I've laughed at COVID-19 jokes. Oh, by the way, the people who are watching, you know what kind of jokes you can tell to the coronavirus, about the coronavirus? Inside jokes. (laughs) But then when I laugh, sometimes I feel guilty, too. There are people all over the world, all kinds of different people, that are not laughing right now. They're in hospitals. Their loved ones are in hospitals, and they can't go visit them because the hospital is closed. There are those who have died and those who grieve, and and so there's guilt at laughing when I think of that. Not, Not burdensome guilt, but enough that it just kind of sobers me up, you know? 
I realize that the whole world is groaning right now, and so we should be careful with our laughs. So I'm sad, too. Heartbreaking, isn't it, this whole thing? It's just devastating. When you realize that those numbers they give on the news aren't even numbers, they're actually people. They are people who have died all over the world. They are people who spent two weeks just hoping their symptoms didn't get any worse. They are the children of a parent who's not feeling good right now. And no, sweetie, you can't go in and lay down with mommy in the bed. It'll be a couple of weeks, okay? And, and dad is just holding on with everything that he's got. Man, it's been sad. We've surely felt all the, um, these emotions too, right? Insecurity, that's a big one. We've, we're used to having everything we need and a whole bunch more. And suddenly we realize that we're not as much in control as we thought we were. We, we thought we were, but a virus, if a virus can do this, if a, if a virus can cause the whole world just to shut down, I mean, I mean, if a virus can just cause us to push the pause button on life, then how much in control were we all along? And so we're insecure, we're fragile. What emotions do you feel? What emotions have crept through you in this time? All these emotions that we're feeling, all these emotions that we're dealing with, you know what I think they are? I think there's God's gift to us. I think there there are gifts from God. We should never feel guilty about these feelings or even squelch them. We should be wise about them, but not dismissive. I believe emotions are gifts from God. I believe they are God's gift to us so that we feel our way through this world that we live in. Life affects us deep because that's how God designed it to work. God wants us to feel our way through life. I believe that. Let me tell you why I believe that. Jesus had a a very dear friend named Lazarus. Lazarus wasn't one of the 12, but let me tell you, if Jesus' concert came to town, Lazarus is watching a show from backstage, you know? Lazarus was loved by Jesus. Jesus, in fact, loved the entire family. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, and you know how Jesus loved those folks. Mary was the one who poured perfume on Jesus and then wiped her tears away off of his feet with her hair. This was a family Jesus cared about tremendously. He had deep, deep feelings for them, you know, deep love. So anyway, Lazarus fell sick. He was real sick. He had no energy. He had no strength at all. He couldn't even get out of bed. He couldn't work. He just just languished, you know. Maybe he had the COVID. I don't know. Maybe he had something even worse. Whatever it was, Lazarus died. Jesus was told about it, and he went to the town where they were from. And when Jesus got to town, Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. He had been in the grave. He was stone cold dead. When Mary heard Jesus was in town and was looking for her, she went out to where he was, and she asked him, Lord, why didn't you get here in time? If you'd have been here, everything would have been okay. Everybody in town was a little asking that same question. Jesus, if you had only been here. If you'd only been here, I wouldn't have spent the last few days crying because I miss my brother, if only. Jesus asked where they buried him. I guess they thought he wanted to go pay his respects. He had a different plan. But before he went on through with that plan, something very interesting happened. Mary took Jesus to the grave, and when she got there, she did what we sometimes do when we go to the graveside of loved ones. She broke down. She lost it right there at the graveside. I've done that at gravesides. I'm sure you have as well. And when she did, you know what happened? The craziest thing happened. Jesus didn't avoid the motion, even emotion. He, he, even though he knew everything was going to be all right, he didn't push the emotion away. You, you know what Jesus did? Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. It's in John 11. Jesus wept. It's just as simple as can be. Jesus cried. Jesus cried because the moment called for a cry. People were hurting. Lives were devastated. And so Jesus cried along with everybody else. Jesus wept because that's what Jesus felt on the inside. And my point is, if Jesus wept, tell me how weeping isn't a gift from God. What's wrong with Jesus weeping? Nothing. In fact, it was right. John says that in a couple of verses later that Jesus was deeply moved. Those are emotions and they're gifts from God. It's how we were created to feel our way through this life. Jesus had other emotions at times, too. He had anger. Jesus could get sideways with people. I mean sideways. We, won't, we don't pay attention to that Jesus quite as much, but what would Jesus do, WJ, WJD? Well, he'd flip tables. 
And if somebody's trying to take advantage of somebody they shouldn't be trying to take advantage of, he might chase them with a whip. That's what Jesus might do. He called some folks hypocrites and brood of vipers. That seems a little angry. Jesus could get mad, real mad, if it was warranted. Can emotions like anger be a gift? Jesus sure felt joy at times. Later in John, he told a bunch of people that if you are obedient to God, if you do God's will, that's exactly what you'll find, joy. That joy is knowing that you're doing exactly what God has called you to do. Joy is living as God calls us to live. Existing in this world, how God created it, is joyful. Now, not everything is going to be happy. Not everything is going to be happy-go-lucky after that. But it will be well with our soul. Amen? Type amen if you believe that God will give us joy when we live the way of God. If we're doing God's will, there ain't nothing to lose. We can enjoy this ride. Anxiousness? You think Jesus was ever anxious? Father, please take this cup away from me. Please, Father, I don't want to do this. Those nails will hurt. The whip will hurt. The words and the spit and the gambling from my clothes will hurt. Anxiousness? Dread? Yes, he felt that. But your will, Father, not mine. Your will be done. Jesus felt these things. They were the feelings that he had, and I believe they are gifts. They are what makes life rich and deep and meaningful. And Jesus felt them deeply, which makes them good. These emotions we feel right now, they're okay. In fact, I believe they're gifts from God. Like anything else, though, it's how we use these gifts that matters. It's how we live them out that determines if we're living life in God's righteousness or in sinfulness. Anger can be directed so many places, but only a few of them are good. Many of them only bring division and and hate and, and violence and all that evil stuff that evil does with anger. How will we use ours? We shouldn't dismiss it. We just have to make sure we're using it for God's glory. What about anxiousness? We don't dismiss that, do we? It's real. I feel it, but how do I use it? If we don't, maybe we feel shame about it. Or maybe we lock ourselves away and and feel worse. But what if... What if we told somebody that we're dealing with it and they told us that they're dealing with it and suddenly we're not alone in our anxiousness? We're together making it through this whole thing and these tough times even when we're anxious about it all. I know scripture says to not have to be anxious about nothing, but what if I am? Can I use it to God's glory anyway? Can we allow it to bond us together rather than making us feel alone? What of sadness? We're sad, but sometimes when we cry together, don't we find healing? Like when Jesus cried with Mary, I believe something amazing happened. Don't you feel like something amazing happened spiritually with you when you can cry with somebody else? Sadness is is okay. It's real if we use it to the glory of God. Even insecurity. Maybe, Maybe insecurity can be a gift so that it reminds us to never think we're too much in control. Because we're not. We are a virus away, and when we realize that, maybe we draw closer to God and closer to other people. Maybe that's how we give our insecurities to God. What I'm saying is, is that when Jesus had these emotions, Jesus had these emotions, he leaned into God's will with them. He didn't avoid them. He relished in them. But only when he allowed them to be the good gifts that God allowed them to be. He didn't abuse them. He allowed God to work through them. Now, the devil tempted him to do otherwise. Three times he told Jesus to use that feeling of pride in a way that would make him proud in other ways than just being God's child. Three times Jesus was tempted in the desert, but Jesus told him to go away because he wasn't going to use his gifts in any other way than how God designed them to use. It's all about how you use your gifts. Are they returned to God or does does evil use them against our will? So in these days... When you're feeling these emotions, and you will, when times are heavy and different thoughts find their way into your minds, it's okay. It really is. It's how God made us to be. And those emotional gifts are good, but they're used best to the glory of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like happened with Jesus Christ. It's okay. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm anxious. I'm giddy at times. I'm somber. I'm sometimes more patient with my friends and family than I am at other times. My emotions are all over the place. But my prayer this week is that we all find our own way to give emotions to God. 
and allow it to propel us to love our God and love our neighbor absolutely as much as we can. That's what we really need these days. So know that your emotions are good. They're real, and they are a gift. Now go use them to the glory of God. And all of God's people said, Amen. We're going to have one more song this evening, or this morning. James and and Philip are going to have one more song for us. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that in this moment, at your table, and your chair, wherever you are, I just hope you find an opportunity to give your emotions over to God. Allow this song somehow to bring us into relationship with the Lord. And let's just admit to God some of the things that we're feeling inside and allow God to work on those so that we can give those gifts to God. You all sing along if you know the words. God bless. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. tell you a quick funny story uh, and a a moving little story about me forgetting the Lord's Prayer 
when Suzanne and I got married uh, 23 years ago, I hope that's correct, or she's going to get on me in a minute, um, we had to have our worship service in some church, and so we decided to go back to the church that my father had pastored when, when he passed away. And so I go onto the pulpit, and right there on the side of the pulpit uh, was the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, and I realized that that was the exact same Lord's Prayer and Apostles' Creed that my dad had on the pulpit uh, the last church he was at when I was a little kid. And it was right there because, well, we forget things when we get nervous, which I was. But there's something about that tradition. And someone said, why don't you take that with you and, and, and keep it? And I was like, no, we're going to leave that right here. It's been there for 20 years at that point. Why in the world take it? Um, these are the, the neat things of life. And in the midst of our embarrassment, maybe something can good from, come from it, the, the emotions that we feel. So just know that all these emotions, all these things that we exist in life can be used for the glory of God. So here's the benediction. Go in love. Go in joy, go in peace, go in grace, go in mercy, and know that it's okay what you're feeling. And we can use it to God's glory in everything we do. Lord, release us from this place, but never from you. And God's people said, amen. Y'all take care. Oh